he had these terrific conflicts between what was good for his career and what was good for his conscience. And uh, with most artists in America, I'd say with 99% of the artists, this, con this conflict gets uh, easily solved very early by agents and managers and producers and sycophants that hang around them and everybody goes for the bucks. And if Phil wanted to take that route, there's no doubt in my mind that he had the talent to, uh, to pull in millions of dollars. But his conscience always threw him back to the streets. Uh, and uh, his, uh, his politics always drew him, you know, closer and closer to the movements he believed in. In a building of gold with riches untold Live the families on which the country was founded And the merchants of style with their vain velvet smiles Were there, for they also were hounded The building was fully surrounded, and the noise outside was the ringing of revolution. Probably the best thing that I could say about Phil was that he was there, really. That he was there whenever you needed him, whenever some little, no matter how small the group or big the group, whenever anybody asked. I can never remember him turning down anybody, any benefit, any chance. To, uh, to sing for a cause he believed and he really he Bill Oaks was t was there the ice cubes would clink as they freshened their drinks sweat their minds in bitter emotion and they talked about the ringing of revolution you know he was really one of the founders guiding spirits of the yippies he understood that instinctively when was this about 60. Six, yeah, it would be, uh, I guess, uh, around the rising of the Pentagon. Um, in October of 1967, about 50,000 of us uh, uh, were able to uh, rep lift the Pentagon off the ground and uh, Could you explain? exercise it of its evil spirits. Could you explain and, that uh, in a little more detail? Well, you had to be there to see it, you know. I don't know if I can really explain these kind of things, but uh, how it worked, you mean? Yeah. Well, well, I, w I mean, at that point we had, uh, I think we, there were a number of us, Ed Sanders, Jerry Rubin, um, Bill Oaks, a uh, number, Ginsburg to some extent, poets, artists, uh, committed radicals, uh, people that didn't believe in art for art's sake, but art for a good sake, uh, for a higher sake, uh, uh, who felt that the combining of a cultural revolution with a political revolution would be an extremely powerful ingredient to bring the message to masses and masses of people. I declare, along with thousands of other Americans, the war is over. And if you think you're surprised to hear the war is over, imagine how the administration's going to feel when they hear about it. See, Phil was really a, a singer for the masses. That was one of his great frustrations. And of course, his great idol was Elvis Presley. He always wished that he could have his mind inside almost the body of Elvis Presley so that he could bring to millions and millions of people what he felt in his heart. I mean, if they don't have the courage of their reality to declare this war on, we should at least have the courage of our imaginations to declare it over. So do your duty, boys, and join with pride. Serve your country in her suicide. Find a flag so you can wave goodbye. But just before the end, even treason might be worth a try. This country is too young to die. I declare the war is over. It's over. It's over. It was interesting how the uh, war is over phenomenon came about. Phil got the idea that uh, we should put together a demonstration to declare the war is over. And he ran around frantic. He'd get very, when he got onto an idea, he got as manic as uh, most of the other creative artists that you know. 
and he designed posters, and he got the World War II poster of the sale of Kissing Linger. We were going to make it a reality, and we all gathered in Washington Square Park, and of course he sang the song, and about 5,000 people uh, just went streaming up the boulevards, you know, into all the stores and every, hug hugging people, the war is over, the war is over, and uh, it, it was quite effective because in that moment they, they had to say, well, what would it be like if it was over? The battle in America is between the child and the machine. Jerry Rubin and I conducted I a proxy Phil. debate for several years, usually through Phil. And I kept telling Phil that uh, Jerry was a bad influence on him, and Jerry kept telling Phil that I was uh, a backward liberal influence on him. I don't want the system to survive. You do. In the 60s, um, myself and the people that I worked with, you know, we, we were very self-confident about, about our position, that we were right and everyone else was wrong. To me, America, is the death society. Yeah. And so therefore, even though Phil, who was just a little bit to the right of us, shall we say, you know, we would have these huge arguments. I remember at one Washington demonstration, he ended a song by saying, okay, when you're protests today, be sure to protest with dignity. And I remember we get so upset about that because what right does Phil have to preach to us about dignity when the United States is undignifyingly dropping bombs on the Vietnamese. And anyway, is dignity really going to end the war? What's going to end the war is total outrageousness. And that was kind of my difference with Phil. Phil believed in reason. He thought that reason would finally end the war. speech against the Vietnam War on the uh, floor of the United States Senate. And Phil came with me, and he sat in the uh, press gallery as Kennedy gave a speech, which was a very emotional and moving denunciation of the war policy and the bombing of North Vietnam. And after the speech, Kennedy flew back to New York on the shuttle, and Phil and I flew back with him. And uh, on the plane, uh, Phil, without a guitar, uh, sung Crucifixion for Robert. Uh, and I think midway through the song, uh, Robert Kennedy understood that the crucifixion was partly about his brother, John Kennedy. And uh, he was absolutely wiped out by uh, this rendition of Phil singing crucifixion, just tapping his feet on the, in the back of the Eastern Airlines shuttle on the day that Robert Kennedy finally liberated himself from his brother's mistake in Vietnam. for the presidency of the United States. I run because it is now unmistakably clear that we can change these disastrous, divisive policies only by changing the men who are now making them. I shall not see, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. No one, no matter where he lives or what he does, can be certain who next will suffer from some senseless act of bloodshed. And yet it goes on and on and on in this country of ours. Why? In 1968, I was a very active supporter of Robert Kennedy, campaign for the Democratic nomination, and most, most of my friends were active supporters of Gene McCarthy, including Phil. And uh, I felt very strongly that while McCarthy uh, had the courage to run for president and uh, was very good on the issue of the Vietnam War, he was uh, indifferent to the cause 
of poor people and indifferent to the problem of racism. On the Saturday before Kennedy was uh, assassinated, Phil and I flew together from New York to Los Angeles. And I think in the course of that five and a half hour flight, I made all these arguments to Phil. And I think that did convince Phil in the final hours of the California primary to change his affections from McCarthy to Kennedy. It was as traumatic for Phil as it was for many people. I think Phil had a weakness for apocalyptic events, and for him to be in Los Angeles on the night of such an apocalyptic event as Kennedy's assassination, I think it did uh, have an effect on his, uh, his politics and his view of the world. singers to participate politically in the Festival of Light. We had conceived of this whole alternative in this park by presenting a kind of Woodstock, but Mayor Daly didn't give us any permits, so there's just a few brave souls that came, and just about everybody chickened out. Bill was basically downbeat, probably a liberal, in a sense. You know, a liberal who liked Che Guevara. You explain it, I don't know. <laughs> he would go off and sing with Gene McCarthy, you know, and then come and hang out with people who were totally opposed to Gene McCarthy because he was so outraged by American imperialism, you know, which, which motivated Phil. The speakers at Grant Park tried to prevent riotous behavior so that demonstrations would not be broken up by police. Protest singer Phil Oakes spoke against any violence regarding the demonstrations. His pet phrase was, quote, keep your cool, unquote. He believed that outraging the country was not the way to go, but at the same time, he liked the yippee sense of theater. For example, Phil was arrested in the Pegasus demonstration. The first day of the convention in Chicago, we brought a pig to the uh, Civic Center, and we said the Democrats are running a pig, the Republicans are running a pig, and here's our candidate. Why should we be any different? Our candidate's garbage. And Phil was one of the six people arrested. We went out, uh, my little band, Jerry and I was starting and had some friction at that time. And I went out and got this pig, you know, and we paid good money for the pig, we did a lot of good bargaining. We got the pig in the back of the car, we bought the pig back, we put it there, and Reuben came in and said, the pig's no good, it's not, it's not ugly enough, it's not big enough. But I said, this is our candidate, it's not supposed to be ugly and big, this is the pig we love. So, and the party split, and they went out and they got their own pig, you see, so, so Phil was trying to uh, <coughs> mediate between us. Uh, the, the two pig factions at the same time talked to the McCarthyites trying to bring the Hubert Humphrey people together and try to cool out Mayor Daly. <laughs> he was playing, <laughs> I don't know if he had a chance to sing a lot of songs <laughs> those few days in Chicago, but he was in a, a mighty peculiar role. And with George McGovern as President of the United States, we wouldn't have to have Gestapo's tactics in the streets of Chicago. George McGovern, we wouldn't have a National Guard. After Chicago, Phil was very disillusioned. He could not believe what actually happened in Chicago, because basically he was a social democrat. And when he saw democracy in action in Chicago, he really was honestly shocked. And when he came back, uh, he got the idea for the rehearsals for retirement album, which was basically that he had died in Chicago, that the American ideals had died in Chicago. The whole idea of democracy had died in Chicago. And so that's why he put the tombstone on the cover of the rehearsals for retirement album. And he wrote a bunch of songs spurred on by the Chicago incident. And then after that, when that album didn't do that well, 
After that, he started searching again for another direction, and there was no stimuli anymore. <laughs> I'm a topical singer. I'm not a folk singer per se, I'm a topical singer. And after nine years of being a political singer, I, I, I definitely do have a reaction against the counterculture. I, I think that the, the whole idea of having a free counterculture is, is a disaster. I think that, that in order to have a real revolution, you have to have one country. You, you, to, to have this, this, uh, this free counterculture is isolationist, and, and, and Nixon is using it against us. Nixon is, is very definitely uh, conducting his campaign and essentially using the line, uh, it, no matter what you might think of me, I, I'm straight, and I'm a regular guy, and if you don't have me, you're going to have some hippie freak uh, who's going to have uh, dope in the streets and destroying the country. And, and he's using that line very, very effectively. Every, everything is uh, quite a bit harder than I realized. This was a song that always made me a little bit sad when I'd hear him sing it. But, uh, because Phil was always talking about immortality and, you know, like, this was great and this one was great. And this is he had a very historical sense of, of everything. Anything that moved down the street had some kind of historical value. So, but I always loved this tune. It's called When I'm Gone. There's no place in this world where I belong when I'm gone. I won't know the right from the wrong when I'm gone. You won't find me singing on this song when I'm gone. So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. When I'm gone And the pleasures of love Won't be mine when I'm gone My pen won't pour a lyric rhyme When I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it While I'm here Won't see the gold the sun when I'm gone, and the evenings and the mornings will be one when I'm gone, can't be singing louder than the guns when I'm gone, so I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here, there's no place in this world I belong when I'm gone And I won't know the right from the wrong When I'm gone You won't find me singing on this song When I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it I guess I'll have to do it I guess I'll have to do it
when you combine Chicago with Kent State, that pretty much killed the movement. And so without that, uh, Phil was at a temporary loss, and then he started, uh, came up with this weird idea that since, you know, we all grew up on early rock and roll, that he thought basically for a revolution to work in this country, you'd have to get somebody that had, uh, the persona of an Elvis Presley in the mind of a Che Guevara. And so he said, wouldn't that be great if you did that on stage? You know, like, uh, politic if, if Presley became politicized, if Presley would actually come out for something, I mean, you could just think of the impact that would have. And he said, well, since Presley won't, why don't I do it? Hollywood, California for the last couple of years. I don't think it's had any effect on me. I'd like to do a song now that was first recorded by someone who was very near and dear to my heart way back in the 1950s. Could this be the generation gap? As you know, I, I died in Chicago in 1968. And I got to go to, to, to heaven because I was a very, very good boy and, and I wrote very lyrical songs. And, and while, I, while I was up in heaven, I, I spoke to God. And God said to me, Phil, you know, it's almost over down there on earth. Just a couple of days left. But you can go back and you can be anybody you want to be. So I thought, now who would I want to be? Bobby Dylan. And then it hit me. The person that I would like to be most is the king of pop, the king of music, Elvis. <laughs> Well, since my baby left me, I found a new place to dwell. Pulled down at the end of Lonely Street at Marbury Hotel, baby. Mostly you hear about the first show, which was a disaster. But I was at the second show, sang no more songs with him at the end. And uh, people wouldn't let him off, you know, he was a... He, was a, he, really, uh, he really freaked out at that, at that concert because it, the first show bombed so much that uh, a couple of his fans asked him for his money back. The ticket booth wasn't cooperating with him, so he put his fist through the window, <laughs> cut his thumb up pretty bad. As Phil went out and played that set. It's completely different than the first show because Phil, after he cut his thumb, he was kind of in a state of shock, which opened up to the audience completely. They've been so long on lonely street, they're never coming back. At the end of the show, uh, he got standing ovation, and uh, the people wouldn't let him off, and so they actually turned off the power. Phil started chanting, uh, give us the power, give us the power. Everybody was up on their feet, chanting, give us the power. Oh, let's not be narrow-minded Americans about this now. I think, I think what we're doing up here is music. I think it deserves to be heard. I am America. I am gold. I am money. I am hip. I am moral. I am America. I am the world. His last friend.
had high regard for him as a very talented writer. I did not personally think he was a good performer and told him that. But there's something interesting. He was very determined to make it in this business and to make it in a commercial way. He was extremely uh, jealous, I think, of Bob Dylan, who was a contemporary of his, and uh, had vowed to me at one time that he's going to be much more popular and bigger than Bob Dylan. Of course, this never happened. And I think one of the big problems that he had over the years is this compulsion to make it, that is to make it commercially. He had certainly recognition in the folk music field as a very good writer and would have been able certainly to make a reasonably good living. But he wanted to reach the top, and this was never achieved. And, well, as we know, the situation when he then became imitative of Presley was a thing that many of us just scoffed at. Anybody outside of a small circle of friends Outside of a small circle of friends Outside of a small circle of friends Now, me, I go way back to the time of the students. When the students were striking over, if you'll excuse the expression, political issues. The purpose of the 60s was, was to educate, not just America, but the world. And that succeeded. These people sitting up in Vermont growing vegetables, they, they, they know what's going on. They're not the same crew they were back in the 1950s. And they're going to make a comeback at just the right moment. But. If they misjudge the right moment, we'll all be dead. Seems bitter. Show me the whiskey stains on the floor. Show me the drunkard as he stumbles out the door. I'll show you a young man with so many reasons why there but for fortune go you or go on you and I potentially a tragic figure and became a tragic figure. And the song is the personification of the way in which people reach out to one another because they see the pain and the inequity in life. And if that is not the turning point for the kind of activism and human connection that characterized the 1960s, uh, then for me, looking back on it, I really don't know what is. Philip Oaks, Purifile number 100 441378, returned from Europe and Africa.